When I was a kid, I was like Wendell from The Simpsons. You know, the one who threw up on the bus every morning. Which is a pretty cool way to make new friends. Please try not to shake the seat like that. The solution the bus driver came up with was that I stopped eating breakfast in the morning. That seemed to help for a while. And then high school happened. And it started all over again. Hey, Wendell, you made it, buddy. <laughs> Which is a great way to start a new school. Who doesn't want to be friends with the puking kid? We all know teenagers are a super forgiving group. His parents were on the price is right. A boom. His parents are dead! Oh, can I get anything right? Eventually it stopped again, but my nervousness kept chugging along. <laughs> you see, it wasn't actually breakfast that was the problem. I had an undiagnosed anxiety disorder, something that would remain undiagnosed into my 30s when I had a panic attack at the zoo. <laughs> my anxiety was the cause of me missing a lot of school, doing terrible at jobs, and did not help me at all in relationships. There are many reasons why this got missed. It's easier to dismiss a kid as dumb and lazy. It's easy to assume that someone is just shy and awkward and will grow out of it. And of course, there are Bible verses for that. This says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. I was also the kid who went to church Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and any time they had special events. Pretty much any time the church doors were open. Praise be God, praise be God, genius, call me genius, holy, 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 holy. I guess I was more like Rod and Todd Flanders than I was Wendell. <laughs> Knock that off, you two. It's time for church. We're not going to church today. <gasps> what? You give me one good reason. It's Saturday. Okily dokily do. Hens love roosters, geese love ganders, everyone else loves big flanders. See, the thing is, the church doesn't have the best track record when it comes to mental health issues. Before I go too far into this, I just want to say that I am not a therapist or a psychologist or, or, or any way an expert in mental health. These are things I've noticed in my experience and the experience of people around me. Also, if your church was really great for your mental health, and it was the place you felt you should be, then that is awesome. But everyone's journey is different. There, that should take care of the comments section. Problem solved. When you grow up going to church, there are certain things you hear over and over again that can make you feel ashamed, guilty, or put you in a state of denial when it comes to your mental health. You can feel like these struggles are your fault, and the result of not trusting God the way you should. But some waves are waves we make, and sometimes we create our own anxiety, and then we ask God for peace. But how can He give you peace in a situation that you're currently creating? So this is one answer to the question, why do we still get depressed? And it may be that we are, even though we've received the truths, or we've heard the truths that the Holy Spirit has been sharing with us, we may not be believing those truths. Now, I don't care how much word you think you know. When you're depressed and you're down and you're stressed and you stay that way day after day after day, that's being faithless. Depressed? I'm the furthest thing from depressed. I mean, look at what I've accomplished. Do you see him? Do you think a depressed person could make this? No. I'm done with that sad, woe, woe, me, old depression kind of thinking. I'm done with that. I choose not to think that anymore. Jesus, I choose your way of thinking today. That the Lord told me, at the center of your anxiety is your pride. He can fill your every need, and He won't disappoint you, and you won't want to commit suicide after you have come to Him. A true Christian is never depressed or have suicidal thoughts. You have those when you're not Christians. Well, first of all, through God, all things are possible, so jot that down. Let me say this. Have you been hurt? Get over it. Say it. Get over it. Have you been criticized? Get over it. Have you been rejected? Get over it. Have you been betrayed? Get over it. Have you failed? Get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Today is a new day. This day is a new day. Act like it. Talk like it. Then stop it. I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, childhood. No, no, no. We, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop it. <laughs> so I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good girl. 
when you're told constantly that you need to get over it or snap out of it, or your feelings are a sign that you aren't trusting God, it adds to a feeling of worthlessness and failure that makes the situation worse. There are also times that we were told it was a sin against God. I think we can think, oh, I'm just anxious, I'm worried, but I'll get over it. Or I'm just, I'm a little anxious, but, but I'll, I'll be fine. And so I think in some ways it can be an acceptable sin, it's, it's, it's acceptable. The most frequent command of the Word of God is do not fear. It says those words over a hundred times in Scripture. And then if you add those kind of words that says do not worry, do not be anxious, it goes over 300. It is not a suggestion, it is a command. And if we believe God's promises, we will have joy unspeakable. And the joy of the Lord will be our strength. You see, a joyless Christian who comes into church and says, Praise God, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God, what's the time? Let's get out of here. That's not, that's not unfortunate, that's sin. That which is not of faith is sin. I've never sinned. Can I be a priest? You never did anything wrong. Nope. You've never stolen anything. Mm. Okay, that's good. Well, then you're right up there with Jesus, I guess. Slowly at the top. Yes, Paul and Jesus uh, explicitly command us not to be anxious, so being anxious is a sin. What do you have to fear? If you have God on your side, and He's stronger than everything else, in fact, not, He's not just stronger, He is minutely in control. You don't have to fear. In fact, if Jesus says, fear not, if he says, do not be anxious, and we are anxious, it's sin. Yeah, totally. Totes my goats. Cool. Could you imagine if they did this with other illnesses? Someone up there saying that your lupus was a sin, or you need to repent from your Lyme disease? Um, I, I can't be here until Thursday, because I'll miss school, and my friends might find out where I am. There's nothing to be ashamed of, Craig. Depression is a medical illness. If you were diabetic, would you be embarrassed by that? The other issue is that the Bible describes things that we would see as mental illness as demon possession, which has caused a lot of people to continue thinking that they are caused by demons, or at least not ready to rule out that possibility. You know, one very muggy Miami afternoon, my parents decided to surprise my brother and me with an early Christmas gift, an exorcism. <laughs> yeah, seriously, they flew in an African pastor from like an African charismatic church, you know, where they run on hot coals and scream in tongues. Yeah, they also perform exorcisms on a weekly basis. <laughs> uh, the exorcism was primarily intended for my brother who has schizophrenia um, because my very loving but very superstitious Nigerian parents believe that mental illness isn't just a disease, it is also a demonic curse. So yes, the demonic can be making the depression worse, but it's rarely the only cause of the mental illness. Don't be too quick to think it's a chemical imbalance. In Saul's case, it wasn't. Saul was a handsome man. He was the king. He had all the wealth and prestige of the people. The people loved him. There was nothing wrong in his life. And yet the Bible says an evil spirit of the Lord would come and fill his heart with fear and depression. An evil spirit filled him with depression. I'm a demon. It's building up and undergirding who we are and our identity. If we didn't receive that, it'd be easy for the enemy to bring something like depression into our lives. Really though, stemming from what we would call an unloving spirit. An unloving spirit keeps us in, in conflict about ourselves. Mend them! What have you done I to make them? them small! What else? Ah, I destroy them! How have you destroyed him? Ah, ah, How have ah, you destroyed him ah, in Jesus' name? Ah, when did you enter him? Young! How have you destroyed him? Rejection! Everything! What have you done to his family? No love. And the Oscar goes to... Do demon-possessed people even exist in the United States today? And the answer is yes, they do. I mean, you don't see them in malls and schools very often. They're 
most likely in urban areas or on the streets or in mental institutions. Oh, cool, 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 no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. See, that woman was oppressed. She was bound. She was in an institution. She could not rise up for herself. Mm -hmm. She could not stand in the gap for herself, nor could the young woman who called me. But I had faith, yeah. and I could do it. So I bound those spirits of darkness off that woman. And you know, she was totally set free in her mm. mind. She was totally set free. She was released from the institution. So here we were trying to serve God while the way we felt and the way our brains works was considered a failing, a sin, or even an evil spirit. So you continue to push it down further and further. Because even if you do admit it and you realize you need help, there are boundaries to that too. Are you allowed to take medication? Doctor, I've always relied upon the kindness of strangers. What is, what are you doing? What is that, a streetcar named Desire? I'm in desperate need of medical intervention. You see, years ago, I tried to burn my college roommate down to the box springs whilst she was sleeping, and now, I have a hankering to do it again. Times that a person can, can find themselves in such a dark place that medication can be helpful to help them get out of that extreme darkness and they can begin to reason. The ultimate answer though for all of our hearts and minds is the truth of God's word. Some people ha have a chemical imbalance and there are treatments for that. And I endorse the medical treatments for diseases that are of the brain, but we can change our brains and we can impact our brains with the word of God because Jesus is our healer and either he really heals or he doesn't. And if he really heals and he's the same yesterday, today and forever, which he is, he does and he is, then we can believe that he can heal us of mental illness too. He can heal us of depression. He can heal us of anxiety. But here's his number one method of healing us from anxiety and depression. And that is perspective, focusing on what we have, what we have, what we have, what we have. Who understand the effects of medication and understand the effects of sin. What you don't want to do is treat a spiritual problem as a physical solution. And sometimes there's a dual course, but there's always a singular course, which is to run to God in every way that God says you should run to Him. The Bible can help people work through that. Science says you've got a disorder, you need medication. The Bible says, no, you're you're not disordered. In fact, if you didn't have some sort of emotional response to these awful things that so many soldiers see, then we'd say something is wrong with you. The Bible says we can comfort you, we can help you, we can teach you, we can work through these things biblically by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so the movers, the shakers, the happy homemaker. You'd be surprised how many of them Are you allowed to see a therapist? And they said, if you would like to appeal it again, you can, but you have to go to see a psychologist. <laughs> Serious. And I have this thing about psychology. I believe that Christianity is not psychological, it's supernatural. The foundation of it all comes from Freud and people that he influenced in, in Germany, or actually it was in Austria, and in Vienna, Austria, and then he influenced many, and the, and the foundation of his life was atheism. Mm -hmm. So when something is born out of atheism, what are you going to get out of it? Uh, the, the truth is, we are emotional beings, but the scripture deals with that. The Bible is simply opposite of every major secular psychological observation about human beings. But what have we done in the church? We've integrated the two concepts. Get it. Cute. You leave this pen here and people are supposed to think, wait, that looks like a dick. Now you might say, why is that? Because psychology, you'd be amazed that a lot of it is pseudoscience, just like evolution. A lot of it is pseudoscience, like evolution. Sure, sure, sure. Cool, 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 Then it's not just about what mental health issues are worsened by the church. There's also the issues of the damage the church can do to us, like teaching kids that they are going to hell for not believing things the right way. And listen carefully: little children are not too little to go to hell. They are under. 
the sin of Adam's original transgression. And they are going there unless Jesus Christ saves them. So how do we teach little children this doctrine? Well, we've decided at Puritan Publications to put together a full color, fully illustrated children's book called or creating an environment where people don't feel like they can be who they are or teaching people they need to change who they are to fit their standards. Can you leave my church and go put on man clothes? And don't come here like that no more. Thank you, Jesus. I, I hold a standard in here. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do on the outside is your business. But I would not let drag queens come in here. And I'm gonna come in here, you're gonna dress like a man. But he says after Welsh College found out about his recent surgery, officials told him he can't live in the dorms anymore. He was also suspended for two terms. When Welsh College kicked me out, they essentially said I did not deserve an education at their college. Welsh College released a statement saying, quote, the college acknowledges that the fall of humanity into sin has introduced brokenness into God's good creation, including in the realm of human sexuality. Being comfortable in your own skin is never a bad thing. Oh my God, right. Okay, so if I got like more skin or something, then I could like never do a bad thing in my life. And maybe I never have done a bad thing because I have a lot of skin. She was upset and crying, asking me if, if God still loved her, if she was wrong for the way that she feels. Shelton says Rejoice Christian Schools, where they've been enrolled for several years, expelled her daughter Chloe for telling her classmate she had a crush on her, a move that's left her shocked. I would have to change who I am to be a member of your church. The language would be repentant. There needs to be some repentance here. For my marriage. Church like the one I grew up in, you're taught that homosexual feelings are actually temptations from the devil, and sometimes you're even told that demonic forces are trying to possess you or are possessing you, and they're the result of these feelings of attraction. That is very anxiety-inducing and stressful to think of as a concept in general, and when you're a kid, you don't really know any better, so that's just something that you sort of believe off the cuff. So when I was growing up, I did believe that any feelings I had towards guys was sin and I believed that it was the devil trying to influence me and I would always pray that God would change me. I prayed so hard to try to pray the gay way and it didn't work. No or if that doesn't work, torturing them to change who they are. They had to fight each other to be more manly and if they weren't hitting each other hard enough, then the man who helped run the conversion therapy camp would step in and do the punching for them. So it was in their best interest to hit each other as hard as they could. Conversion therapy has been around since the 19th century, utilizing methods ranging from invasive questioning to electroshock. These practices have since been opposed by the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the Pan American Health Organization, and more. Oh, I just wanna feel better. You'll never feel better. Stop it! You're wretched! Leave me alone! You should be ashamed of yourself, you sinful little creature! Ah. Or teaching young girls that their worth lies in their sexual purity? Whatever the fuck that means. One day, probably within seven or eight, maybe ten years at the most, every beautiful girl, every lovely creation of God in this room, every precious teenage girl, you're gonna walk down an aisle in a white wedding dress, just like Aaron, look clean on the outside. But the issue that's going to be real in your mind, and only Aaron and only God knew if he had his underwear on, when you walk down that aisle, while everybody's looking at the outside, will you be able to say, I kept my underwear on? Too much inf one man's too much information is another man's too little information, T-L-I, and one other man's J-E-I. Just enough information. Virginity is cool. Come on, come on. Virginity is cool. What up? What up? Virginity is cool. He's got it. He's got it. Virginity is I wonder if there aren't kids who, for one reason or another, couldn't live up to the expectations that you have for your children. What happens to them when they feel they've failed in this purity journey? Don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. Don't have sex in the missionary position. Don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it, promise? 
Okay, everybody take some rubbers. I remember the first, like, official purity talk that I ever had was in middle school, and it was with one of my um, female science teachers. I remember she described it like a piece of tape and saying how if you stick a piece of tape to something, it might stick really well the first time, but then if you take it off and keep trying to stick it on other things, eventually it won't stick. Look what that did to Elizabeth Smart when she was kidnapped. I remember in school one time, I had a teacher who was talking about, well, about abstinence, and she said, imagine you're a stick of gum, and when you engage in sex, that's like, that's like getting chewed. And then if you do that lots of times, you're going to become an old piece of gum. And who's going to want you after that? Well, that's terrible, but nobody should ever say that. But for me, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm that chewed up piece of gum. Nobody rechews a piece of gum. You throw it away. And that's how easily it is to feel like you no longer have worth. You no longer have value. Why would it even be worth screaming out? Why would it even make a difference if you are rescued? Your life still has no value. And what that does to countless women. I then went on to study in graduate school American evangelical messaging for girls in terms of sex and gender. And over the course of this, these research that I had done through interviews and through this research I had done in school, I pieced together a devastating pattern, which was that evangelical Christianity sanctified sexual fear and gender-based oppression was creating a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder among today's young women. Growing up in this kind of culture can cause so many issues, and far more than I even mentioned. There is even a name for it, religious trauma syndrome. So we often think of war-related trauma, like stereotypical PTSD, or we can think of sexual trauma. And I think that religious trauma is another uniquely identifiable set of traumas that has a particular set of um, post-traumatic effects. What is particularly difficult about religious trauma is the way in which the religious context, the theological framework, the sorts of ideas and concepts, beliefs that the, that the community holds often make it difficult for people who are being traumatized to recognize what's happening to them as abuse, as a form of trauma, as something that is problematic at all. Um, like I said, I'm not a therapist or expert in this area, but I am someone who knows how much it means to know that you are not alone and you aren't. I am going to put some resources in the description. I know access to therapy can be limited by your financial situation and a number of other factors, but if you can do it, it may really help. If you can't, there are many online resources, or if you can, find a friend who you can open up to about this stuff. Taking care of your mental health is as important as taking care of your physical health. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no shame to it. <laughs> and once again, it's not a sin. And also, let's continue to fight for people who can't fight for themselves. Let people know you love them just the way they are, that you're proud of them, and that you're there for them. If you can be that support for people, it can go a long way. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Sorry about the beard. Even if they throw up on the bus every morning. I guess this is the end, Wendell. He's Wendell. I'm Lewis. Whatever, just tell Wendell I said bye. Thanks for listening. If you know someone who may respond to this, please send it to them. And feel free to like, leave a comment, and uh, if you can, subscribe. Thank you so much. Love you. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs> <laughs>